We're in the Ve'yu Shalayim. We're doing the mystical Hebrew alphabet series. This is the letter Aleph, the shape and meaning of the letter Aleph. This is part one. In the Hebrew alphabet series, we have um, a code, and we believe that this is the only language that is God-given. The alphabet is God-given. I teach this class on college campuses, and the reason I do is because um, there's a very large percentage of Jews out there that believe that the Torah's man-made mythology, and therefore the people in the Torah never really lived and the events never took place. We believe that God gave Torah to the Jewish people in Mount Sinai, and one of the ways to figure that out is to look at the Torah deeply in its original language. The Torah is not that deep in translation. Anytime you translate a text, you distort it. But <clears throat> we believe that if you look at the original Hebrew, when God gave the Hebrew alphabet, he gave it as a coding system. Every letter has a meaning. The shape of the letter has a meaning. The mathematical value called the gematria of the letter has a meaning. And uh, therefore, every word in the Torah not only has a dictionary definition, but on a deeper level, every word in the Torah is the sum total of the meanings of its letters in that particular order. And there's no other text you can do this with. You can't do this with the New Testament. You can't do this with the Quran. We believe all those other texts are man-made. So we're going to start very simply with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I gave you a chart with the names of the letters on the outside. The middle column of this chart is the kosher column. The right-hand column is the way letters are printed in a textbook. We're going to ignore that. That does not have meaning. But just the uh, middle column of each set there. Okay, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, and it has a mathematical value of 1. Anytime you see oneness in Judaism, all onenesses always allude to <laughs> the infinite oneness and infinite perfection of God. Um, now, you can't say that Aleph is a godly uh, letter because you can't represent God with shapes. That would be idolatrous. So there must be some sort of hint to some godly meaning in the letter Aleph. And that's what we're going to be trying to look at. What did um, God do when he, wants to represent, when he wants to represent his oneness? Why did he use such a complex X-like pattern? Why didn't he use a simpler shape? more unified shape to represent his oneness. So that's what we're going to be headed for this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for hints to godliness in the letter Aleph. And the first hint is uh, that Aleph is the only silent letter of the alphabet. Every other letter of Hebrew has a sound associated with it, including the letter Ayin. In modern Hebrew, they decided to make Ayin right. They decided to make it uh, silent because it's a guttural. It's too hard to pronounce. But in the Torah, ayin actually has a sound, and it's not a silent letter. Aleph is the only silent letter. Why? Because just like God didn't give himself a physical expression out into the world, he doesn't assign a physical sound to the letter that represents his oneness. There are other um, messages in the letter Aleph. Uh, Aleph itself as a verb, to Aleph something in Hebrew means to educate. That's why Aleph is the root of the modern Hebrew word ulpan, a place where you go to learn something intensively. So what's education thematically? Taking something low potential, raising it to a higher level. You got an 18 year old with no job skill, four years later they're an accountant. So education is also Alephing. Aleph is also used in a context to take oneness to a higher level because you look in the alphabet, you have your ones places you have your tens places, you have your hundreds. When you get to oneness in the next system up, you get to thousands. And the word elef is the same word as aleph. It's oneness lifted up to a higher level. Also, alephing in the Torah is used to refer to somebody who raises himself up and takes himself to a higher level. And that's the Hebrew word aloof. Thank you. The Hebrew word aloof is the leader of a nation or a leader of a tribe, like we speak of aloof Edom, the leaders of the nation of Edom in the Torah. So aliphing is always taking something a low potential and raising it to a higher level. Okay, so far so good. So why, why use this complex X-like pattern? So if you look at your chart for the kosher aleph, not the one I wrote on the board, but if you look at a Torah-shaped aleph, you'll see it's really a combination of three letters. A uh, kosher aleph in the Torah is an upper yud, a lower yud, and a slanted vav. So the question is why? Why did Hashem take three letters, 
put them together in a complex pattern like this and say, okay, this is going to represent my oneness on some sort of level. So why is that? So for that, we need to know the meaning of life according to Judaism in 90 seconds or less, okay? The meaning of life according to Judaism is um, you are a soul. That's the essential you. You have a body on loan. The combination's good for 80, 90, or 100 years. Who knows, you know, to 120. Um, and then the combination doesn't work anymore. You can't say that you are the cells of your body, per se, because the cells of your body are constantly replacing themselves. You don't have the same cells you had a few years ago, right? They taught you that in high school biology. So when you're born, you're this big. By the time you hit your teens, you're this big. You're at least four or five bodies later. So all those cells are constantly replacing themselves. What Your sense of self really is spiritually beyond the limits of the cells of your body. So we really believe the central you is a soul, the body's alone, that combination is called you. The meaning of life according to Judaism is to take that combination and make decisions which connect you back to God. It leads to two very easy but very simple definitions um, according to Judaism. The definition of good are those decisions you make which connect you back to God. And the definition of evil are those decisions you make which distance you from God. And notice that the definition of good, connection, and the definition of evil, distance, have nothing to do with what you like. Meaning, good is that which connects you even if you hate it. Evil is that which distances you even if you love it. Okay? So fine. So based on the definition of good and evil, let's play make pretend. <clears throat> what if you could go back in time pre-day one of creation? What if you can go back in time before there was a Big Bang, before there was a universe, before there was time, matter, space, and energy, before there was reality? If you could go back pre-everything, according to Judaism, what was there? What would you say? Before anything. Before energy, before matter, before time, before whatever. Pretend you could go back pre-everything. Pre-creation. -pre God, right? According to Judaism, there's the infinite oneness and perfection of God. <clears throat> Why? Because according to Judaism, God always is. In other words, there is no before or after. A universe isn't always an is. A universe has to have a source. So time, matter, space, and energy have a source. God doesn't have a source. God just is. So listen carefully. According to Judaism, God is the only thing that really is. Meaning God is the only thing whose existence isn't dependent on anything. Everything else needs a source for its existence. <clears throat> Make sense? So therefore, if, if, God, if God is, then you and I live in a universe of isn't. What do I mean? Our universe isn't God per se, it's what God wants to exist. So therefore, if God is and everything else isn't, then if you and I live in a universe of isn't, it's only because the is, God wants the universe to exist because nothing else has existence but God. Does that make sense? Everything is what God wants. That's where we exist, in, in something called what God wants. Good, because we're going to come back to that. Now, if pre-day one, all there is is the infinite oneness and the perfection of God, because he hasn't done anything else yet, and you could, let's say, somehow go back pre-day one of creation, before there's a universe, and all there is is God. Let's play make pretend. So you'd say, well, what should I do today? Well, today hasn't been invented yet. I guess I'll connect back to the infinite oneness and perfection of God. There's nothing else here, right? So therefore, if there's nothing else there but God, and the meaning of life according to Judaism is connection back to God, then logically speaking, it doesn't get any easier to fulfill the meaning of life according to Judaism and connect back to God other than pre-creation. Because connection back to God would be easy. There's nothing to distract you. Okay, fine. Now, next... Let's take it one step further. Let's say God does want there to be a universe. Let's say God does want there to be 100 billion galaxies, or God does want there to be time, matter, space, and energy. So on day one of creation, whatever day one means, on day one of creation, let's say God wills some sort of existence. So that means if you could go back in time to day one, it would be harder to connect to God than pre-day one, because pre-day one, all there is is God. But on day one, there's more out there that God created to distract me. Make sense? So now, if you follow the logic, with each succeeding day of creation, 
as, as the universe gains order, structure, and complexity, as time, matter, space, and energy unfold, it's going to get more and more difficult to connect back to God than the previous day when there was less there to distract you, right? So let's go back pre-creation. Pre-creation is easy to connect back to God. There's nothing else there. But as God creates a reality beyond himself, with each succeeding day of creation, whatever these days mean, it's going to get more and more complex, more and more difficult to connect back to God. Therefore, it's going to get harder to fulfill the meaning of life. Pre-day one, it's easy. On day one, pretend those six days of creation, as the Torah describes them, is God creating a mask of nature of physics, chemistry, or biology to hide himself, right? Now, it's not clear what the Torah means by these days. It's very hard to figure out because you and I refer to a day as rotation of the earth relative to the sun. But the sun, the, sky, the, the stars, everything isn't created until day four. So it's not clear what we're talking about. But I think what I want you to do is re-look at the first six days of creation as God creating a mask of nature, which gets more and more ordered, more and more struct structure, more and more complex, and makes it harder and harder to connect back to. Pre-day one, it's easy. On day one, it's a little harder. On day two, it's harder to connect back to God than day one. Day three is harder. Day two, day four is harder. Day three. By the time the Torah describes day six, human beings are put on the other side of day six, and we're told the meaning of life is connection back to God. But now the mask of nature he hides behind is so thick, you can go through your entire life an atheist and say connection back to who? I don't know if God exists. I don't know if Torah is true. I don't know if I have a soul. I do know I got to go to work. I got to pay my bills. But God's spirituality, Torah, who knows? That's how thick the mask of nature got over the first six days. So let's think about this for a second. If the whole purpose of creation was connecting back to God, the act of creation over this first six days made it more and more difficult to do that, which is another way of saying that the purpose of creation and the act of creation were opposites. And if you and I can figure out that the purpose of creation and the act of creation were opposites in under three minutes, why couldn't God figure that out? And the answer is he could. So why did he do that? Why did he make the whole purpose of creation connection back to him and the act of creation make it more and more difficult to do that? And the answer goes back to when I was in the fifth grade. Now what human beings understood, before I was in the fifth grade, I don't know, but I figured it out because what we used to do, and you would never do this, but what I used to do, it, what we used to do, I can only blame myself, we used to take paper clips and bend them and then hook them to rubber bands and take aim at the hit, head of the kid sitting next to us. And, you know, the only time you could shoot that kid in the head with your paper clip or put it down is when the teacher was out of the room. Because when the teacher was standing in front of your desk, you never dodged a rubber band or paper clip, you didn't want to get in trouble. That's exactly what God's doing. The only way to generate human free will is for God to pretend to be out of the room. That's the point where your free will begins. So therefore, what we're doing is we're relooking at the first six days of creation as if God is creating a mask of physics, chemistry, and biology just thick enough. So maybe God's in the room right now, maybe he's not. Maybe science can explain everything, maybe they can't. Maybe the universe is one big random accident. What a coincidence, aren't we lucky? Maybe they're wrong. So the point where maybe God exists, maybe doesn't, that's where your free will begins. No free will, no relationship. If God created you to have a relationship with him, He's got to go into hiding, so maybe he exists, maybe he doesn't, to give you free will. Think about it for a second. God's so infinitely, overwhelmingly perfect, and so infinitely, overwhelmingly pleasurable, that if he were to take the mask he hides behind to give you free will, and let's say he were to decide to rip that mask apart for 30 seconds, appear in front of you and say, hey, guess what? I really do exist. So now what are you going to do? Be an atheist? I mean, like... You know, you would just grab on. You wouldn't be able to let go. You'd be like a robot or a zombie. God doesn't want a nation of robots and zombies, and therefore he has to go into hiding, find the mask of nature. So to give you free will, no free will, no relationship. I often tell my students at Neve that if the day before you get married, I had to take, if I were to take your fiancé, and by using a combination of hypnosis and chemicals, I were to brainwash this guy into loving and adoring you, so much so that he marries you and he follows you around the apartment all day like a lovesick puppy. He don't want to go to work because he can't stand the thought of, wait for, of being away from you for eight hours. So for the first few hours of marriage, you'd love it. Then you'd throw him off the building. You don't have a husband, you got a robot. You can't be married to a robot. What makes him a relationship meaningful is his ability to walk away and his decision not to. It's the same for Judaism. What makes a relationship God, with God meaningful is your ability to walk away or deny his existence, or at least deny his presence, and your decision not to. Your job is to say, listen God, I know you're up there. The mask of nature doesn't fool me. I want a relationship. 
But you also have to be, be able to say, free will requires you to say, oh, come on, there's no such thing as God. Religion is a bunch of superstition made up by primitive people to explain things that scared them. I don't believe in any of this. I'm an atheist. I'm out of here. And you can walk away. That's free will. No free will, no relationship. Fair? That's the reason the first six days are creating that thickness. Enough hiding so maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't. And <clears throat> that's such a fundamental accent. That, by the way, is why when you look at the last 4,000 years of Jewish history, you'll see God does not like doing miracles that destroy the laws of nature. In the last 4,000 years, it's very rare. Splitting the sea, very rare. You know, ten plagues in Egypt, very rare. I mean, because he destroys the free will of that generation of Jews who are standing there thinking, oh, well, there goes atheism out the window. You know, what am I going to do? Deny God's existence? So it forces people into a relationship. God doesn't want to force into a relationship. Okay? And this in Jewish mysticism is the deeper meaning of the Hebrew letter Vav. The Hebrew letter Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And whenever you see sixes, you always think physical completion. Six always represents physical completion. It's the mask of nature which hides God. In other words, take any three-dimensional object which is a part of the mask of nature which hides God. Like this plastic uh, uh, eraser. Any three-dimensional object which is a part of the mask of nature which hides God always has six expressions to it, right? It's got up, down, or two, east, west, north, south, or another four. That's that sixness of the mask of nature, so that maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't, maybe he's in the room right now, maybe he's not. In other words, what we're trying to do is explain, if God wants to go into hiding, why did he create six of these days, whatever these days mean? God's outside of time. Six days are a joke. He could have done everything in the first instant of the first day. Time doesn't mean anything. So why is he stretching it out over six? So six always alludes to the thickening of the mask of nature, to hide God. So we're going to call Vav the mask of nature, which hides God. That's why there are six of these things creating that mask so that you can have the free will to believe in God or to walk away. So now, Vav has another definition. If you go into a, Vav, uh, if you go into a hardware store in Israel and you say to the guy behind the counter, I need to buy a Vav. So what do you walk out of the store with? In Israel, Vav, literally in Hebrew, is a... It's a hard book of it. It's a hook. Coats are held up on code Vavs. Uh, that's why in the Torah, if you look at the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert, you'll see the curtains were held up with Vavs. So a Vav is a hook, which makes perfect sense, because in other languages, grammar is designed to punish high school students. Agreed? In Torah, grammar teaches philosophy because God designed it. So therefore, if a vav literally is a hook, if you put that V sound, that vav, in front of a noun, right? The word for chair is kise. So what do I say? Ani, vi, there's the vav. Ani, vi, a kise. Right, so vav functions as the conjunction and, A-N-D. Why? Because and hooks things together. And vav literally is a hook. Okay? Good. So now, if I were hired as God's graphic artist, and he asked me to design a letter representing the mask of nature he hides behind, I wouldn't have chosen the shape of a vav. A vav, in essence, is a straight line. It's not terribly physically complete. Um, if I were God's graphic artist, my my letter of physical completion, the mask of nature, would be very, would have a lot of ink because ink is physical. So my letter would have ink, movement, texture, a certain je ne sais quoi. That would be my letter of physical completion, right? I was not consulted, so that is not the letter of physical completion. The vav is, but you know, you got the idea. It would be a work of art. But if God hired me and said, listen, I want you to be my graphic artist, but I want you to design for me a letter of spirituality, non-physicality. What would a spiritual letter look like? Well, I'd say, well, that's easy. Since ink is physical, why use ink? You want a non-physical letter? You know, a letter that represents heaven as opposed to the physical world, or a letter that represents your soul as opposed to your body, or a letter that represents your thought as opposed to your brain. Why use physical ink to represent a spiritual concept? I'd say, you see that blank spot right there? That would be my letter of spirituality, and I wouldn't use any ink, to which God would probably reply, 
nice try, but you can't write a Torah scroll where every time you want a spiritual letter, you'll leave a blank spot because you won't know where words start and stop. So if God comes to me and says, listen, I want you to design a letter of spirituality, but you've got to use ink. I say, fine. If I have to use ink, I'd make a dot. Least amount of physical ink possible. And that would be my letter of spirituality. And that's exactly what God did. Because if you look at the alphabet, you'll see the least physical of all the letters and the only letter that floats in the air is the letter of spirituality. That yud, that tenth letter, is a tiny drop of ink that floats. All the other letters, Aleph, Bey, Kimmel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, they can all sit on a line. But yud is a tiny drop of ink that floats. And therefore, whenever you see yuds in the Torah, you have to think spirituality. Yud represents heaven as opposed to the physical world. Yud would represent your soul as opposed to your body. Yud would represent your thoughts as opposed to your brain. So Yud is the Torah's letter of spirituality. So the rabbis ask, well, <clears throat> fine, but why did God assign Yud a value of 10? What's so spiritual about 10? See, Yud is the 10th letter of the alphabet. I thought 7 was spiritual, 7 is Shabbat. And there's lots of 10s in Judaism, but they don't seem spiritual to me. Like the Ten Commandments don't sound so spiritual. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Those sound pretty practical to me. Like, why... Why do you, you know, there are tens in Judaism, but they don't necessarily sound spiritual. So why did God assign the letter of spirituality value of 10? So to answer that question, let's go back in time, pre-day one of creation. Let's go back before there was a universe. Let's go back before there was time, matter, space, and energy. Let's go back when all there was was the infinite one, the infinite perfection of God, nothing else. So fine. So if we say God's infinitely one, not sort of one, not kind of one, but infinitely one, then by definition, there can't really be anything else because if there's anything else, God's not infinitely one. You hear the problem? In other words, let's say God decides he wants an electron to exist. Let's say all there is is God, infinite oneness, infinite perfection, and then poof, he makes an electron. So how, how can we say God's infinitely one if there's an electron there? The electron's not God. So why doesn't creation of a reality called our universe or whatever it is with billions of galaxies, each galaxy billions and so on, why doesn't any creation violate God's infinite oneness? Listen, this wouldn't be a problem if we said God's sort of one or God's kind of one. But if we're going to say God's infinitely one, then, then that's all there is. So the idea of God creating a reality without it violating his infinite oneness is very strange. So it's not my question. It goes way back in Jewish philosophy. So there was a um, Kabbalist, a um, rabbi who was an expert in Jewish mysticism who lived about 500 years ago. We call him the Arizal. He lived in Svat. And uh, he tries to answer the question with a two-step metaphor. And um, this, uh, this metaphor is, is not really the big picture of what God did because we're never really going to understand God. We, we have finite brains that are locked within time, and you can't use a finite brain locked in time to understand God who's infinite outside of time. So this metaphor is going to try to help our brains come close. So his metaphor is two steps. It's actually very simple. The first step is negative. second step is positive. And he says, if you try to understand this metaphor, he tries to answer how God's creating reality beyond himself without violating his infinite oneness, okay? So I'll do the metaphor for you. Listen carefully. See if you can spot where the metaphor fails because, again, this really can't be what God is doing because we can't understand God, okay? Here we go. In step one of the metaphor, God is so infinitely, overwhelmingly, intensely one then nothing else could possibly exist because he's too, T-O-O, one-ish for anything else to exist. That's the problem. God so intensely one, nothing else could possibly exist. So in step one of the metaphor, what he does is, metaphorically speaking, he pulls himself back and creates a space. Okay? Now this space has a long name. This space is called a space where God is out of the way enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist. Notice, nothing else exists. Step one is God making it possible because he's so infinitely, overwhelmingly, intensely one, nothing else could exist. So by pulling himself back and creating a space where he's out of the way enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist, he makes reality possible. Okay, that's step one. That's a negative step because God's not really doing anything. He's just sort of removing. 
In step two, God wills into the space or zaps into the space reality. That's where everything unfolds. That's where our universe will unfold. Step two is positive because now he's doing something. Okay, those are the two steps of the metaphor. In step one, God pulls himself back enough to create a space where he's out of the way enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist. And in step two, a positive step, he wills reality into existence and causes reality to exist. So we're going negative to positive. Okay? Now, those are the two steps of the metaphor. I told you it wasn't really accurate. Did you spot where the metaphor failed? So the metaphor really fails in the idea of, one second, what do you mean God pulls himself back and gets out of the way? Where did he go? In other words, you don't have to talk location, but if you're going to talk in a metaphor locationally, you have to talk infinitely everywhere. So God doesn't pull himself back and get out of the way to create a space where he's out of the way. There's no such thing as God getting out of the way. God's infinitely everywhere if you're going to talk everywhere, right? So the metaphor failed in its first sentence because it's very weird to, to have a concept where God's removed. There's no such thing as God removing. You follow? Okay, good. So now, along comes a later commentary on the Arizal who lived 500 years ago in Sfat. This rabbi was also a Kabbalist, but he lived a couple hundred years ago. Uh, his name is Rav Chaim from the town of Belajan, and he, he brings a... He rewords the Rizal's metaphor to make it easier on your brain. In other words, this later rabbi says, listen, what he's trying to say is hard on your brain, but I'll say the same thing he says, but I'll say it in a way that's easier on your brain, you'll get less headaches, okay? So listen to how he rephrases it. Remember, he's saying the same thing. So this later rabbi says, instead of saying in step one, God pulled himself back to create a space where he was out of the way enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist, he says simply, why don't you say in step one, God hid himself enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist. So step one is negative because God going into hiding. And then you don't have to think of God going anywhere. It's just step one is God hid himself enough to allow for the possibility for something else to exist. And in step two, he wills reality into existence. So we're still going negative to positive, but we don't have to use metaphorically him getting out of the way. You follow? Yeah. So if you understand those two steps of the metaphor, you now understand where Judaism and science go their separate ways because a lot of people think that Torah and science are not compatible. And the truth is Torah and science are very compatible. The, the, the problem where we have a fundamental disagreement with science is in that two-step metaphor where step one was negative, step two is positive, right? This two-step metaphor, by the way, um, explains why we Jews have such a weird way of tracking time. Remember, we went negative to positive, correct? So if you lived thousands of years ago and you needed to change from one day to the next, you know, nowadays we call the first day of the week Sunday, the second day Monday, the third day Tuesday, and so on and so on. So let's say you wanted to transition from Monday to Tuesday in your civilization, but there weren't any clocks yet. Let's say there were sundials, but that's it. Thousands of years ago. So when would you decide to stop calling Monday Monday and start calling it Tuesday? So two methods would work, sunrise, the sky gets light, it's a new day. That would make sense because people would go off to work on a new day. So you'd say Monday ends when the sky gets light the next morning. Nowadays we don't do that, but, but that would make sense. Or another way to transition from Monday to Tuesday would be at midnight when people are asleep, which is less disruptive. So Monday ends at midnight, Tuesday begins. That's what we do nowadays. So you can really track midnight if you can figure out when noon is because Noon is when the sun's directly overhead. If you divide the day into equal segments, you just make midnight the reverse of whatever noon is. Make sense? So you could use noon, you could use, I'm sorry, you could use midnight or you could use dawn as transition from days to days. So we Jews have historically always started our day when the sun goes down, which is very weird. Why would Monday become Tuesday at sundown on Monday? You ever thought about that? It would make sense to transition by day, one day to the next at midnight or at dawn, but not sundown. You know, if you were an Orthodox Jewish lawyer on Wall Street and it's Monday afternoon at one o'clock and it's December 20th and you know the, four go, the sun goes down, let's say at, uh, I don't know, 4.15 in the afternoon in December in Manhattan. The sun goes down very early. So at one o'clock in the afternoon, your boss says, I need to report on my desk by five tonight. 
you say, oh, you want it by tomorrow. And he said, no, that's not what I said. I said, I want it by 5 o'clock today. You say, well, the sun goes down at 4.15. 5 o'clock is actually Tuesday. He'll look at you like you're crazy. But according to Judaism, that's true. Our day ends at sundown. That's why Shabbat starts at sundown. You follow? Yeah. It's very strange. But, but when you think about it for a second, it's exactly what the metaphor is saying. Because in step one, God goes into hiding. That metaphorically would be darkness, correct? Step one is darkness. Step two, willing reality into existence, which is positive, would be light. Light always represents Hashem's will. So we're going hiding to light, hiding to light. That's why every day of creation is there was evening, there was morning one day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. So you see why we're starting our day in step one of the metaphor when everything's hidden. Whereas the other nations don't do that. Do you follow? Yeah. Okay, so let's take uh, Judaism and science going their separate ways. Let's take the plastic chair, okay? And, le and let's say I'm speaking to a secular scientist. So I say, Mr. Secular Scientist, where do the carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens, the plastic come from? So we'll say, well, to be honest, um, uh, atoms like this come from early star formations, which come from early galaxy formations, which come from, you know, back, 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 back to a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. So then you say to him, okay, I'm curious, uh, where did that Big Bang come from? So if he's honest, as a secular scientist, he can say, we, we don't know. We're not sure. Working on theories, very hard to figure out. That's an honest answer. What he shouldn't tell you is, it wasn't God. There's, there's no such thing as God. Because science is really, when you boil down to the simplest ideas of science, science is really based on extrapolation and interpretation of things you can measure. This is really built on things you can measure. And pre-creation, pre-universe, pre-time, matter, space, and energy, pre-physics, it's very hard to measure things before there were measurements. So when you say, well, where did creation come from? He, he can't measure whether it was God or not. That's not a scientific question. It might be a theological question, but it's not a scientific question. So if he's honest, he has to say, we don't know where creation comes from. You know, we think it's a big bang, maybe it was God, maybe it wasn't, we don't know. We don't know is an honest answer for science, but don't let a scientist start telling you whether or not it was God, because he has no way to determine that. Y you follow? But when he looks at the chair, he says wherever the creation came from, when, when creation forms and galaxies explode into existence and stars form, eventually you'll get carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, which you can use to make into the plastic of this chair. And therefore, according to him, the chair has an existence in and of itself. According to Judaism, nothing has an existence in and of itself except for God. God is the only thing that really exists. Remember we said at the start of the class, God is, everything else isn't. Meaning God is the only thing that exists without a source. Everything else needs a source. So according to Judaism, the chair needs a source. The only thing that exists in and of itself is God. Everything else has to have a cause. So therefore, if you could go to a store, I'm making this up, and buy spiritual glasses, which allow you to see spiritual things. Pretend you could put on glasses, which allow you to see a spiritual reality beyond the physical world. So you'd put on the spiritual glasses and say, hey, guess what? I thought the atoms, molecules, electrons of the chair had an existence in and of themselves. That's what this, the science has told me. But now that I put on my spiritual glasses and I take them and look, I see that every atom, molecule, and electron and all their interactions are constantly being beamed into existence by an infinitely one, infinitely perfect source up there. But without the glasses, you can't see the beams. Meaning, according to Judaism, the chair has to be coming from something. It doesn't exist in and of itself. Nothing exists in and of itself. You know, it's like, you know, you know when you go to the, um, you know when you go to the movies and you see an actor walk across the screen and you say to yourself, oh, come on, there's no one walking across the screen. That's silly. The screen's just a white piece of material. And there's a projector in the back of the room and it's firing frames at the screen where in the studio they took pictures of the actor where in every frame the picture his leg is in a slightly different position. And what the projector's going to do is it's going to fire those frames at the screen at a rate of 24 frames a second. Now, 24 frames a second is so fast your retina can't refresh its image at a rate of 24 frames a second. So your eye is fooled 
into seeing a fluid motion. But if our eyes were faster, we'd see there's no fluid motion on the screen. It's really hundreds of single images, too fast for your eye to follow. According to Judaism, that's reality. The reason why you and I see a constant image of each other is because we're being recreated so fast, so many times per instant, we look like we're constantly here. And it's true for you, it's true for me, it's true for the chair, it's true for the rest of the universe. According to Judaism, creation's not 13.8 billion years ago. According to Judaism, creation's every single instant. Creation, according to the Torah, is constant. Every instant, God is hiding himself enough to allow for the possibility for something to exist outside of himself because he's so infinitely perfect, nothing else should exist. And every instant, God's causing that thing to exist. So let's graph it, because I think it's easier to see on a graph. If we pretend God's up, even though he's everywhere, and we say the spiritual realm, heaven, has lots of levels in it, which it does. Each one subdivided, subdivided, subdivided. So you get thousands and thousands of levels up there. Let's pretend this is the bottom of the spiritual realm right here. Let's call this the bottom of heaven, metaphorically speaking. So from here down is our universe with its billions of galaxies. Each galaxy is billions of stars. And we'll put a human being down here on the planet Earth. Okay? Fine. Let's say God's will looks like red light, because I want to use a different color. Okay? So up here... God so infinitely, overwhelmingly, intensely one, we'll call it a billion, trillion, gazillion watts of infinite oneness, infinite perfection. It's so overwhelmingly, intensely, infinitely one by God that nothing else could possibly exist because it's too T-O-O, one-ish for anything else to exist. So now, what God's going to do is he's going to send his infinitely one, infinitely perfect will down through the spiritual realm. Now, when he causes these spiritual levels to exist, all these thousands and thousands of levels of the spiritual realm, when he wills them into existence, because remember, heaven has no existence. Get rid of the kindergarten idea in Sunday school where God is up in heaven and he created the earth. There's no such thing as heaven or anything. God has to cause heaven to exist constantly. So therefore, when he wills these levels into existence, he causes them to function like filters. Think of thousands of levels of sunglasses. So as he sends his infinitely one, infinitely perfect will down through these spiritual levels, he's actually filtering it down from 100 billion trillion gazillion watts of infinite one to seven perfection down to 100 billion watts of infinite one to seven perfection down to a billion watts, down to 100 million watts, down to a million watts, down to 100,000 watts, down to 1,000 watts. By the time God's will crosses the lowest level of the spiritual realm, he's filtered it down to, let's make up a number. Let's call it point Oh, 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 one watts of infinite oneness, infinite perfection. And it can look like that chair. And that's why, even though every atom, molecule, and electron, every subatomic particle is constantly being willed into existence by an infinitely one, infinitely perfect source up there, you never know it. Because the chair doesn't look godly. It doesn't glow. It doesn't sparkle. It doesn't look spiritual. It looks like Walmart. And in the world of Walmart, maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't. Because God doesn't want you to look at chairs and see godliness. Because he doesn't want the chair to make you religious. He wants you to make yourself religious. He wants you to get there on your own. He doesn't want to force it on you. And that's why you can create the illusion of diversities. Once God's oneness is filtered down to a place where you can't sense it anymore, you can, you can see that the world's filled with things that seem to differentiate. Chairs don't look like trees, trees don't look like rocks, rocks don't look like light bulbs, light bulbs don't look like dogs, dogs don't look like grass, and all of a sudden you look around and you can't find oneness. God says, you're right, I'm doing that on purpose. I don't want you to look around the mask I hide and see how everything's the same. If you see that everything is infinitely one, it'll force you into monotheism. God says, I don't want to force you into monotheism, I want you to get there on your own. And therefore, if we talk in terms of the diversity back in the alphabet, so the meaning of life according to Judaism is I'm here to connect back to God's Aleph. If Aleph represents God's oneness, so the meaning of life is I'm here to connect back to the, the Aleph. What does God say in return? He says, I'm sorry, I can't let you do that. I can't let you connect directly back to the Aleph. I'm so infinitely perfect, infinitely pleasurable, you'd never be able to disconnect from me. You'd be like a robot or a zombie. You would just grab one, you wouldn't be able to let go. I don't want a nation of robots. So God hides his oneness behind a spectrum of diversity where you can't find oneness, right? God hides his oneness behind a spectrum of diversity. God's hiding his oneness behind a spectrum of diversity where you can't find oneness. 
So if you can't get your oneness direct from God because you couldn't handle it because you wouldn't be able to disconnect from it, where's the next place in this spectrum of diversity up here in the alphabet where you can find one of anything? If you can't get your oneness from God because you'd never be able to disconnect from it, you'd lose your free will. Where's the next place there's one of anything up here? Yeah. Exactly. Right here, the number 10. 10 represents unity behind diversity. In, in other words, 10 is one set, nothing left over. When you were in the second grade, your second grade math book tried to teach you that one through nine are all natural numbers, which is why the, your math book used pictures of sticks or pictures of pencils or something. Then they tried to teach you that 10's not a natural number. 10's a cognitive number, it's a concept. It means one set with nothing left over. It's a set. And therefore, your math book used to try to bundle the sticks or bundle the pencils to teach you what a set looks like. See the difference? So 10 is oneness behind diversity. And that's why there's so many 10s in Judaism. Because God's oneness is coming down and dividing the spectrum of 10 to hide himself. Well, in other words... Um, so it's not diversity, it's oneness behind... It's unity behind diversity. I'll give you an example. How many, how many mitzvahs are there in the Torah? 600 and? Right. So why do they distill down to Ten Commandments? The answer is because that's where the unity is. Or, or if you look at the first six days of creation, right? There are only six days of creation, but that doesn't mean there's six statements of creation. If you count up the statements of creation during the first Six days, you'll see the ten statements of creation. Let there be this, let there be this, let there be this. Each one thick in the mask to hide God. So that's why later in history, after God thickened the mask over those first six days to hide himself, to give you free will, maybe exists, maybe he doesn't. So Moshe goes to Pharaoh and says, you know, that same God who hid himself behind ten layers of the mask of nature, you know, to give you free will, maybe exists, maybe he doesn't. If you don't let the Jewish people go, that same God is going to peel those layers backwards and then you'll be left with nothing and you're going to lose. And Pharaoh said, I don't think there's a God up there that can do that. And Moshe said, well, then you're going to lose. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happened. Right? Because if you look at the first six days of creation where God thickened the mask, you can line them up to the ten plagues in Egypt where God thinned the mask to come out of hiding. And that's why they line up in reverse order. We're, we're out of time, so I'm just, I want to just do an easy example. The second statement of creation is called Let There Be Light which corresponds to the ninth plague, which is the plague of darkness, right? So one is putting the, the layer in, the other is pulling the layer out. All tens in Judaism line up, sometimes in reverse order, sometimes in direct order, the Ten Commandments, Ten Plagues in Egypt, Ten Saints of Creation, because they all are God's oneness dividing into a spectrum of ten to hide himself. And that's why ten represents a unity of spirituality behind all the diversity, as opposed to oneness, which is so godly you can't disconnect from it. And that's why the letter of spirituality has a value of 10. And we'll stop here. That's the end of part one. We'll continue with more on the letter Aleph next time. Mm -hmm.